We're here right now with Cassandra Langer, who wrote an amazing book, Erase Her. I was blown away by it. I've read a lot of books on conversion therapy, and this one was gripping, and it really puts you back into an era where some of this conversion therapy began. Today, conversion therapy and ex-gay programs are bad, but they're nothing like they were back in the 1950s when Cassandra was thrust into this world against her will. And let's go and go back to Miami right now, where you were a child. And the pressure to conform is what really stands out for me. Here you are as a little girl coming into your own, your sexuality. And there's all this pressure to be who you're not. What was that like? It was extraordinarily difficult because I was the kind of child who was very impulsive. So when... The conformity project started. It was quiet down. Don't be too loud. Don't make a spectacle of yourself. Dress a certain way. And my mother was particularly concerned with conformity, being, you know, um, Jewish and an immigrant and things of that nature. And really, I think one of the most powerful sentences in your book, you said, my whole life is supposed to be about helping some guy do what he wants. And I think that really defined the era. It did. I mean, the conformity project was you you were supposed to make everything fine so that your breadwinner could go out there and take care of all the business. And you were supposed to take care of everything at home, children, cooking, anything like that. Your role was very clear. So my mother sent me to all kinds of uh, things that would make me an acceptable wife. And that was the last thing on my mind. It must have been difficult for all women in this era, but for a lesbian, a hundred times more so. Absolutely. You don't know what you are. You don't know who you are. You're just beginning to explore. And then I didn't like to do girl things, which was really bad. Uh, from their point of view, and also because I wasn't dressing the way other girls were dressing at that point and didn't want to, my mother slammed me into modeling school, which was an ordeal beyond belief. I had to lose gracefully to boys, and I was the marble champion in junior high school, which was a real problem. Uh, for me. So instead of celebrating your prowess, and, and it was seen as something negative rather than something to celebrate, being intelligent and successful. Yeah, everything that that went against the, the rule of what was ladylike and what a, a girl was supposed to do. Well, you had to pretend you were dumb and defer to boys in their opinions, so you wouldn't hurt their feelings. So you, even if you knew something, you had to go, oh, that's so smart of you. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. And that's what you had to do at the time. Yeah, and build them up while you were tearing yourself down. You know, I also grew up in Miami, and I had my own experience with homophobia. It was not as oppressive as yours, but I came into my own when Anita Bryant launched her Save the Children campaign, I was eight and nine years old during that period. And I remember my parents talking about this. Thankfully, they thought she was horrible. But the whole Save the Children portraying LGBTQ people as pedophiles and stripping away our rights was what I had to deal with. So it was something different and not as intense. But nonetheless, it was really damaging to understand your gay at a young age and that's your introduction to it that this is going to be difficult in many ways and there are a lot of people that hate you for who you are the hidden part of gay miami is what i grew up in which was a very vital community that of course desantis doesn't want us to even know about the interesting thing about miami in the 19 mid 1950s and early 60s particularly was the johns committee they absolutely drummed all of the professors that were fingered as gay. My friend Meryl Mushroom, who's a writer and uh, who has been very uh, active in OLAC, the older lesbian network, in establishing archives so that we could, you know, document these, these herstories as well as histories, because there were all of that kind of separation that went on at a certain point in time between gay men and gay women. 
I remember the uh, Johns Committee still had a shadow hanging over University of Florida. I went there around 1990. There were still some of the older professors who talked about that and the terror of that time and then having their lives destroyed or people they knew had their careers ruined and their lives upended. It was, you had to hide and if you were caught, you were ruined in many cases. Yeah, precisely. And it uh, drove many people very deep into the closet and had horrible, damaging psychological consequences for them. I mean, we had no organizations virtually to speak of. And we had no centers to go to. And how were you going to find people like you, much less a lover or anything that we were looking for at that point? And while you were exploring your sexuality, you had an experience with a girl who then told on you. And that created a real crisis within your family. Just talk about that. Well, that's what catapulted me into um, secular conversion therapy. We were kissing, petting, doing all those kinds of things that you do at uh, 12 or, you know, 13. And it was supposed to be our secret. But she told her mother, her mother told my mother. And the next thing I know, I was sitting down in the living room being asked if I wanted to go to this, this special camp in upstate New York and school. Things were not good at home. I had a cousin who was molesting me at that time, an older cousin, 18, who was my mother's favorite. And I couldn't say a word about it because uh, she wouldn't have believed me anyway. And she herself, as I found out 30 years later, had been molested by my step-grandfather. So it would have been a total disaster. So that was the preamble to my being sent away. And I thought to myself, well you know, this is pretty awful. How bad can the other thing be? I never realized I went from the frying pan into the fire until I got there. And this was uh, helped by a family friend and uh, their their daughter, Adina. Uh, she was very mean to you and, and sadistic in some ways. One quote in the book, we all tried to help you be a normal girl. All you did was resist my hypnotherapy. We both know what you are. I didn't know her very well to begin with. It was her brothers. When Dr. Khan, who was the psychiatrist, con man who (laughs) talked my parents into sending me into his school and boarding program, which they paid a fortune for, essentially what the family friend said to them was, well, you know, my daughter is involved uh, with Dr. Khan, and he was so great, and she's studying under him and interning under him, and Sandy will be perfectly fine. He's an expert. And that's what uh, they said. Well, I, you mentioned expert because it seems at the time, more than today, there was this faith in experts and those who were very well educated. And Dr. Samuel Kahn claimed to have studied under Sigmund Freud, so he seemed to be very impressive. He also ran uh, what appeared to be a a cult at the time, the Dynamic Psychological Society. You know, Wayne, you have to look at it this way. Mothers were in charge of children. My father really didn't know, uh, have a clue. He had a high school education. Mother had a high school education, essentially. Neither of them were college educated. And as you say, upwardly mobile. So neither of them were all that familiar. And they were very impressed by the credentials. And in Eraser, you talk about the persuasion tactics of Dr. Khan. And He really was, in some ways, like a cult leader. Uh, One obituary you pointed out said he unduly controlled and manipulated patients in a cult-like fashion. And this included parents, too, to get himself clients so he could get paid. Yeah, precisely. And he charged a lot. And the way that he financed his program was very interesting. I only found out later through my research what he did was move his his cult followers up to Croton on Hudson. He got them to buy houses and property. And then how he managed to get them to pay their mortgages and everything was by loading up every one of the kids who were disturbed kids who were in the boarding program with various courses that were taught by these unqualified people who supervised us. And then the parents were billed for all these 
extras uh, that were supposed to make us better students. Now, this wasn't just some uh, talk therapy like the great majority of the programs today, which, by the way, are incredibly damaging. But this was a whole different level. He used shock treatment. I mean, your your mom was talking about a lobotomy at the direction of this quack. So your entire life could have been upended and destroyed. So you you really were at grave risk and it must have been terrifying to be a young person. And nobody would have helped you if they had made that decision, would they have? No, nobody would have been able to, to help me at all or any of the people that those decisions were made for, essentially. And I think most of uh, the kids were uh, pretty terrified um, during that period. By then, I didn't understand it. I only found out what a lobotomy was later. And you couldn't even argue because that was seen as unfeminine and a... Uh, reason to give you, say, a lobotomy. I mean, that must have been no relief from this terror. No, none at all. And you had to conform to his rules. And he was a tyrant beyond belief. Even his, his daughter recognized him as a tyrant when I interviewed her. And then you were moved periodically. I mean, I was in three different places during the two and a half, three years that I was there. You're in this situation. And you have this doctor who believes that oh, there's a connection between homosexuality and criminality. Yeah, the mindset of this man. I mean, he wrote a book, actually, on homosexuality and perversion and criminality. And uh, he treated us like we were virtual prisoners. He used to be the expert who advised um, Sing Sing about prisoners and uh, gayness and, and so on. So he automatically thought anybody who was gay or homosexual was a criminal. What struck me is the similarities to today with conversion therapy and ex-gay ministries. They had you talk like a girl, put makeup on, they had leg crossing sessions. Uh, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, they said arguing was not feminine. So that's very similar to today, sort of a crossover to today's um, conversion therapy. Yeah, very much so. And I, I think the kinds of things that you talk about in your new book, especially, are true. The kind of indoctrination that goes on of showing you pictures of, uh, in our case, it would be clothes, it would be kitchens that we might love. Well, what inspired you to write Erase Her? There were a couple of things. The first thing was uh, the various suicides, but I think the uh, Leela Alcon was really the, the, the linchpin there. I had not wanted to really revisit that experience, as you can imagine. My friend, who was a psychotherapist, my girlfriend at the time, she was the linchpin in this. She asked me to come in and talk to a number of her students in clinical psychology. And I thought to myself on the basis of, of the suicides, and I had written a poem uh, about uh, Tyler jumping off the bridge uh, while I was in North Carolina. So I went into the class and I was really shaking to talk about it. And I realized that these, these future mental health practitioners knew nothing absolutely nothing about the origins of where all of this that you write about in terms of uh, conversion therapy, in terms of re religious groups, um, stemmed from. And I was shocked, actually, that they were so clueless. And, and that was the beginning. And then I came home and I started thinking about what could I do to provide information and possible help to a whole several generations who knew nothing, nothing about any of this. And it's really stereotypes disguised as science, if you want to break it down. It's mendacity dis disguised as medicine. They don't know anything about sexual orientation or gender identity, and they make it up and profit off people's pain, and they exploit parents. What message do you want to impart with your incredible book, Erase Her? 
The message I'd like to impart, it's somewhat like Dan Savage's message, it does get better, but you need help for it to get better. And you need a community of like-minded people who are there when you're confused. You need to be able to talk about it. Don't say gay is one of the worst things that, that ever could happen. Parents need to talk to children. Children need to talk to parents. I included an appendix of uh, questions and possibilities for children to open up this dialogue with their parents and for parents to feel comfortable opening up the dialogue with their children in the book. And I hope they will say gay and they will defy these things. Otherwise, we're going to have more of what I experienced and you experienced in terms of repression of perfectly normal people who are damaged beyond belief by this kind of nonsense. Where can people purchase your book? I bought mine. I read it on the Kindle and, and, and loved it. It was a I always love reading on the Kindle. Where can people find your book? Uh, they can find it on Amazon. They can find it in Barnes & Noble. I made it uh, very inexpensive on the Kindle. And I have a paperback for those who like to have a book and underline and do that sort of thing. I recommend it because it's my experience. And if they know nothing, it will give them some idea of the origins and maybe protect them in terms of their own resilience. And it's done so in a way that's very compelling in a story. I thought uh, I did, it was a page turner for me. I did, I, you, know, you made me stay up too late, uh, Cassandra, because I wanted to go to bed, but I couldn't because I wanted to see what the next page was. So thank you for your important work adding to the knowledge of, of ex-gay programs and conversion therapy. I was honored to read it, and it's been an honor to speak with you today. Thank you, Wayne. I enjoyed your book too. And it, it is a book and we are the bookends at this point. <laughs> Lies with a straight face. <laughs> That's my book. You know, any final words of wisdom before we leave? Just be yourself and try and find people who will let you and enjoy your being yourself and do what you want to do as much as possible. Help us fight ex-gay lies. Truth Wins Out monitors, researches, and exposes the ex-gay conversion industry. Support us and learn more at truthwinsout.org.